Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, John Clegg. I'm your moderator for today, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to uh, what is a very timely uh, webinar on uh, well decommissioning. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Steve Cromer. Uh, Steve completed his apprenticeship in the shipyards of the Clyde and then started to work on uh, wellheads, production trees, and well tieback systems. And uh, he ran the first trees uh, west of Shetland on the uh, Foynaven field. Uh, after that, Steve drilled a number of uh, exploration wells west of Shetland and then production wells in the central North Sea before he got into uh, production engineering and uh, completions in uh, both conventional and HPHT wells. Around the time of Macondo, Steve joined the um, Oil Spill Prevention and Response Advisory Group and was assigned to their uh, Global Industry Response Group and set up the Wells Expert Committee of the uh, International Association of Oil and Gas Producers. Um, and these groups made a number of recommendations which have now been accepted and implemented by the industry, both nationally and uh, internationally. Uh, Steve then moved into well decommissioning and uh, initiated uh, the Southern North Sea Well Abandonment Project for ConocoPhillips. Uh, Steve's now taken early retirement, but remains active in the SPE, ISO, and the IMECE, and is working to develop uh, new industry standards and uh, industry collaboration. Uh, before I hand over to Steve, I want to remind people that there is a, uh, a, a box for attendee questions, which is available to you now. And please ask questions as the uh, session goes on. Uh, it allows uh, me to collate the questions during the session. And the earlier you get them in, the, uh, the higher the probability that your question will be asked. So don't, don't be shy and put them in as, uh, as soon as you think of them. But with that, I'm now going to hand over to uh, Steve. Thank you for that introduction. So today we're going to have our decommissioning primer, and this is not going into too much depth. This is for people who just need to know a little bit about the general understanding of well decommissioning. We're starting off with a photograph here of the end point. This is the point where the well has been decommissioned. We're pulling the well head out. You can see it's all covered in marine growth. It's also got a 10 foot or 3 meters minimum length cut from the seabed uh, and it's being pulled to the side. But there's a lot of work needs to be done before we get to that point and that's what we'll discuss today. So my outline today is um, we're going to have a look at legislation to start with that drives everything and controls everything. Then we'll have a look at the general principles of well decommissioning. Uh, I'm going to be concentrating on the UK, but a lot of these are very similar around the world. Uh, you need to look at the particular ones where you are living in the world and where you're operating. And we'll look at the basic requirements that's needed. Uh, data search very important. And how you plan the decommissioning, things you need to consider, uh, including the annual barriers, etc. And then a bit of a look through tubing operations or conventional. And then we'll have some questions and answers at the end. So on the questions and answers, if you could uh, type in your questions into the question box as I go through the presentation, that'll be really useful because I'll be able to look at those and uh, think up some good answers for you, to be honest. And, um, and then we can go through that at the end. So if you could type those into the question box, that would be superb. OK, so the first thing we need to understand is the money. Money makes the world go round. So well decommissioning is roughly about half the cost of the total asset. It's because of the cost of the reg and the well complexity. It can be less, it can be more, but that's a rough estimate. But it does give you an idea of the uh, amount of money that's involved. Now the cost of a well decommissioning increases with the complexity of the well condition. So if the well is left in a good condition, you've got full access, there's not any problems, it's been a great well, uh, you can get access all the way down to the bottom. Um, good, con no annual pressure. It's going to be a relatively low cost well. But once things start to go wrong, once you get annual pressure, once you get tools stuck in the well, once you have problems with cement jobs, the crease increases exponentially. The other thing is, do you really know the state of the well? If you don't know the state of the well, then when you get your very expensive high rig cost 
things stuck over the top of it, go into it and then discover that the scope that you're going to do is not the scope that you thought. Your costs are increasing because suddenly you're mobilising equipment and people unplanned, a change of operation, change of scope. So cost increases with uncertainty. So one of the important things that I'm going to try and stress today is that you try to reduce that uncertainty as much as possible. Find out as much about the well, about, as much on the history, as much as uh, possible about what you're going to do. Get your tools lined up, get your equipment and your people lined up so that you can then do or go in with a slick operation and uh, do it to a reasonably certain cost. Now, one of the biggest problems I've found in my uh, career, which I've now retired, is uh, people have unrealistic decommissioning estimates. And these are based on estimates that when the well was drilled. So some of these wells are 25, 30, 40 years old. And people will say, how much are you going to decommission this well? Oh, it's about a million pounds. But then they de discount that over the years, and then they leave that million pounds sitting on the balance sheet for the next 25 years. And of course, thing, prices have increased, rigs have increased, inflation, etc., etc. And you'll get some managers coming up to engineers and saying, well, there's the cost of the well, a million pounds. And it bears no relationship whatsoever to the modern cost estimates. So that's something you really need to be aware of. Is your decommissioning estimate, which you're holding on the books, does it bear any relationship at all to the modern cost? And when was that last modern estimate made? And who signed the documents? Was it an accountant or was it an engineer? The other thing that I've noticed is there's always pressure on the team to reduce costs from management, from government, from everybody who's involved. We try to reduce the cost. But if you're not careful, you can end up having additional costs because you then have to assume that the well is in a better condition than is realistic. And then you go back into that unplanned, unscoped changes, adding more costs, etc. You end up going backwards to get back forwards again. So the decommissioning cost is a bit of an uncertainty. And if you're not careful, you might as well just take your money and put it onto a, an expensive roulette wheel somewhere in Texas. Now, the other issue which we have on well decommissioning is a well decommissioning operation has a return on investment of zero. There is maybe some money in the book somewhere about it, but the return on the investment on the day is, in fact, zero. So your senior management are measured on the return on the investment of what they do. So some legacy wells can have a low OPEX, so you might as well just leave the well shut in, low cost, and uh, make a return on the investment each year without having this massive cost of the uh, well decommissioning. So if you look at the short term only, it's better to defer decommissioning and review it next year. Then the next year do the same. Then the next year do the same. And then you're seeing your management who have made this decision have had a really good return on investment. They're promoted out and it's on to the next guy. And he'll look at it and think, OK, well, this is a legacy well which I've inherited, so I will defer it. And it goes on and on and on. And this can be an issue because of the way that uh, the way management is and the way things are. So what's going to happen about that? The Oil and Gas Authority. There are 750 dead wells in the UK continental shelf today. All these legacy wells. And there's going to be another 750 becoming inactive and available for decommissioning. So are we just going to defer that? Uh, so the OGA says no. There is pressure mounting on the operators to clear away all those dead wells and tidy up that, uh, spend the money and get on with it. Now, the latest information, this is from the Energy Voice. I would recommend people get that. Um, the OGA is in principle prepared to apply sanctions, even fines for not actually tidying away those old wells. So things are changing, things are going to move forward. So let's assume that we've got the money and we're going to go ahead and do some well decommissioning. 
1.2 million tons of disused offshore infrastructure could be recycled. There were 84 wells decommissioned in 2020, and the forecast is there's another 600 wells going to be done over the next couple of years. So lots and lots of work. And uh, that's the decommissioning insight report again. There's, you can see the references. If I've got any references, I'll put them at the bottom of the uh, screen there for you to chase up and look at the information yourself if you want to. So we have legislation. We have legislation coming out of our ears. These are just some of them. Uh, other countries will obviously have their own. These are the ones that apply in the UK. And in Scottish waters, you'll see there's some Marine Act Scotland there as well. So you need to think about that side of things as well. So if you're in British waters, I would suggest you go to the oil and gas website. Very good asset. There's a lot of information there. And uh, go on to well abandonment suspension and you'll find all the legislation you need to look at. There's clicks throughs there. So another excellent resource for people to look at if they're uh, interested in this. There's lots of other stuff on the oil and gas UK website, so I would generally uh, assume that you go there first. It's an excellent piece of information. But the key piece of legislation which we all work to is the original Offshore Installation and Wells Design and Construction Regulation 1996. And part 15 of that the well operator shall ensure that the well is so designed and constructed that as far as reasonably practicable, it can be suspended or abandoned in a safe manner. After suspension or abandonment, there can be no unplanned escape of fluids from it or the reservoir to which it led. So that's your design and construction regulations. Quite clear. As far as reasonably practicable. Let's make sure we understand this. It means that the degree of risk in a particular situation can be balanced against the time, trouble, cost and physical difficulty of taking measures to avoid that risk. Now, it's slightly different from a lap, as low as reasonably practicable. So, a lap refers to safety critical or safety involved systems, and you would probably spend more money trying to make sure you're as low as reasonably practicable compared to as far as reasonably practicable. So that's very important that you understand the difference between those. If you've got any, there's, there's some good information on the HSE website on that type of thing. So let's have a look at a, a well abandonment. These are some old drawings. I've got some old drawings from legacy documents here, which, but they're very good at explaining what we need to do on a, on a basic uh, presentation like this. So starting on the left hand side, what are we trying to do? We're trying to restore the cap rock. The cap rock has been holding back all this oil and gas and everything else which we're trying to isolate for millions of years. So we need to put that back in place. So in order to do that, we've looked at good practices and these are based on what we've discovered over many, many years of experience. If we put in a height of a 500 foot measured depth along the well bore, containing at least 100 foot measured depth of good cement. So you're saying it's quite good there because you're assuming that you put in 500 foot, but you only get 100 foot. So we're talking about quantity and quality already right at the start. We need to get a certain quantity, but we need to also get a certain quality. The depth of the plug must be deep enough that it holds back the original formation. So the plug depth itself needs to be determined by the formation and the primary cementing job to make sure that it's actually deep enough and strong enough to hold back the reservoir. We must have a good bond to the surfaces between the cement and the uh, casing and the formation if it's there, which means that surfaces need to be water wet. There's no point in having an oil wet surface and then ending up putting in a, a water-based cement, which will just basically not stick properly. And if we are pumping cement, before that cement goes off, there's a danger that it slumps. So we need to support that cement while it happens. So we need to put a, 
a plug or something at the bottom of the well to prevent swamping and then to prevent any gas migration while it's uh, turned from a liquid to a solid. So on the right hand side, again, the elements we're looking for, the good material to get a, a permanent plug, uh, the tubulars, if there's any tubulars in the well where the plug is to be set, they need to be fully embedded in the cement, obviously to the depth of a minimum of 100 foot of good cement quality as well. Um, the original cementing needs to be uh, provable, you need to know what's there, but the formation itself, there's no point in setting a plug in a formation which is uh, permeable, so you need to prove that the formation is strong enough and it contains a uh, future pressures of the well. There's no point in setting it too high up the well, it can't actually take the pressures if the reservoir could, over time, go back to its original pressure. So again, some old drawings, but good at demonstrating the, uh, the key factors here. Steel is not considered a barrier in the long term, so you can't just simply cement and uh, casing and say, right, that's the way the well sealed off. If the casing corroded, you would end up with a, a influx. So you need to put something more in steel. This needs to be a plug in the centre of The basic requirements are two permanent barriers from the surface or the seabed if a permeable zone of hydrocarbon bearing is overpressurized. So a minimum of two barriers. All distinct permeable zones penetrated by the well should be isolated from each other and the surface. At least one barrier between normally pressured water bearing zones and the surface. So you need to uh, make sure that you have uh, but two barriers, all permeable zones isolated from each other if they're at different pressures, and then one permanent barrier between normal pressure water being zones and the surface. So combination barrier. So if you're going to be putting two barriers in, there's no need to put two distinct 500 foot plugs in there. You can do a combination barrier of 800 foot and ensure that you've got 200 foot of good cement and we call that a combination barrier. And of course you need that 200 foot of good cement alongside the annulus at the same position where the, uh, the plug is set at the same depth. So you can be combined into a combination barrier of uh, 800 foot plug. Okay, so many people have thought, okay, what about some of these formations themselves of excellent uh, ceiling formations? In fact, when we were doing some of these uh, smeg tight rich shales, they would actually try to close in on the well. So very good at sealing. Um, so yes, that has been looked at and people have done some research, a lot of that done in Norway, and they are able to close an annual space where the cement is lacking. So the resultant seal can be qualified if you can pressurize below it and prove that there is definitely an excellent seal to above what would be expected, then you can do it with two independent tools and then do your initial pressure test on 100 foot perforation. Seal it up, excellent. So you can use the formation itself as a barrier. So we talked earlier about certainty, trying to be certain of what you're getting into. So the first thing that you must do is look at the wells, look at the old drawings, look at the old diagrams, look at the well drilling reports, look at any work over which has been done, and anything that's been done in the fields, you may find uh, information from uh, wells alongside which could identify problems in this well that you're looking at. So all of that needs to be reviewed. Now I can't stress this enough. Uh, for example, there was one well which I was working on where we were running in the well and I happened across a service hand who had actually run a casing and I said, oh, have you got any information on this well? And he had his old service book. And his service book said that we were running a different tubing size from what was actually in my well report. And eventually I found out that we were actually, we had actually run the tubing that the uh, service hand had run and said had run. So it was actually different from our well report. So that saved a lot of 
hassle when we're out in the field. So gain your information from as many places as you possibly can, and uh, this will save time, cost, and money right at the workplace. So we're going to have a look at a, a well, and I've got a, a sort of nursery well here, just an example, very simple well, very simple geology, but it sort of shows you uh, some of the more critical areas. So if we come from the top here, we have the seabed, then we have uh, the Jurassic, and we have a reatic sand, which is normally pressured. Water bearing is isolated, but it is uh, sometimes connected to the, the seabed. And then we have the Haysborough, that's a shale, and then the Bunter sand. Now, in some areas of, of the world, the Bunter sand is hydrocarbon bearing, but in this particular area, it's not. But it's uh, normally pressured. It's water bearing in this area, low criticality. Then we go into the Bunter shales. Then we go into the salts, the Zechstein group, uh, potentially the Platin Dolomite in there. Uh, and then down finally into Rot Ligandus, where the uh, hydrocarbons overpressured, probably not overpressured now because the well has been uh, sucked dry, but high criticality, it potentially could pressure back up and become a uh, hydrocarbon bearing. So that's the key area that needs to be sealed off. So what we'll do is we'll look through where we set these barriers in this well as an example to uh, how you would go through an operation. So the first thing is, how much cement have we got in the annulus of the well before we even go anywhere near it? So you can look at your old well reports and work out the volumes of the initial cement job, uh, and that should determine the top of cement. Um, we did have one well which we were working on where we the 958 had been actually cemented, and they'd cemented it to return to the surface. So when they actually cemented it, cement was actually coming out the wellhead. So they said, well, 100% excellent, 100% excess, and the well's totally filled from top to bottom. We must have a great cement job on this. When we actually went in and did a, a log on the well, we discovered a channel all the way up the side of the cement. So we had to do a medial job. So just because you've got a very good volume, a very good um, quantity, does not mean that you have quality. And that's an important area when you start looking at this cement job. So you need to have, do your whole calculation, work that out, and then if necessary, if there's still doubt about what's actually there, you need to do a log to prove that there's no channeling in the cement. So you do your history review, uh, look at the pressure and annulus and bleed off from the wells. There's the wellhead there. So the guys are on the platform have been monitoring this over the many, many years. So you review any, any pressure that's built up on the well or any of the annuli. And if they've had to bleed it off, uh, and then when you go, if there's no pressure there, revalidate that when you get there. Top it up, make sure it's topped up, not just full of some gas at the top end, which is giving you a false reading. Um, if there's a shut in case and pressure identified, suspected, you need to do the remedial cement job before you cut the casing, obviously, and then document that in the philosophy document. Um, and some subsea wells where you cannot monitor the annuli, you need to make different assumptions and different but of course, there's higher risk where you make assumptions, so you need to be very careful with that. And then it's important you share the risk assessment with the entire well abandonment team. The geologists, the casings, jobs, the cement people, you know, they'll all have pieces of information which can bring this jigsaw together. So I'm still going on about this annulus. Uh, we need to make sure one way or another whether we've got uh, good cement in the annulus. So you can do that by logs, cement bond log, temperature sonic logs, working that out, estimation based on the original cement volumes. And then uh, absence of sustained pressure, that's definitely a good thing to have. It can prove that everything's okay. Doing leak off tests when shoe was drilled out, that's another piece of proof. So all of these pieces of information 
come together to bring the jigsaw together. And then we'd eventually decide to decommission the well. So we do the planning, spend all your time and your effort at that part. The more you do there, the less you will have in your implementation. Once you've implemented it, you monitor it and evaluate how well that went, review it, and then go back and do another one. So, OGA stewardship, another thing to consider. This is a, a screenshot from the OGA stewardship document. And I probably can't read this, but D28 says, understand the infrastructure and equipment with reuse, repurposing potential, and where appropriate, plan decommissioning such that the opportunity can later realised decommissioning of wells to facilitate future storage projects. So you need to consider the thought that these wells, or this reservoir in fact, may be um, used for something like carbon capture, or gas storage, or any future use. So you need to consider that. So the plugs that you put in that well need to be uh, up to that type of uh, use. So that's another thing you need to consider in your will. Do your full risk assessment, fully document it, assign responsible engineers, get that risk as low as possible. And then you go through each of the risk mitigations, and this is the viatic. It's an interesting one, this. The, it's normally pressured, and the sands above that are so weak that any pressure would just blow through, and it's probably already connected to the seabed. We have never seen any hydrocarbons there, and even if it was charged, it would be so small, the pressure on the sand would have dissipated. So, to be honest, the viatic sand, you don't even need a plug between that and the seabed. It can actually be considered as the seabed. Do the risk assessment, fill out the diagram, make sure everyone's happy with it, and uh, move on. The bunter sand. Okay, the bunter sand a barrier, we're going to put one in, and it's to isolate the bunter sand, prevent movement of fluids from the bunter to sand to the seabed to the reatic. So we will put a plug in the Haysborough. And that right alongside those shales, we know the shales are strong. And then a reservoir. We're obviously going to put a reservoir down in the Zextine, um, and it will isolate the Zextine formations. Uh, and this is, can be placed in the Bulter Shale above the Zextine. The Zextine is a salt, and that will seal off all the Ligandus, all of the, Z the Zextine, all the Platindolomite in one group. There's no isolation between it because uh, all these formations are treated as a single package and they can all withstand future use. So you can see the well. Before we start, we've done a couple of punches there on the uh, casing, and we've got holes there, so we're doing some pressure tests on those, and then we'll go in, we'll set our plugs, uh, combined plugs, a whole bunch of those in there, then set our uh, cement plugs on top, and then cut the 9 and 5 8 casing, set a 13 and 3 8 mechanical plug, and set a double barrier plug on top of that. So here's a, a diagram of a wellhead that's been cut off. And if you look on the right hand side, just below the centre line, you can see a couple of channels there. You can see actually how this looks as though it's full of cement, but in fact there is actually a, a channel up the side. And then once you get your eye in, you'll start to see channels all the way around the outside of that casing. So this is what you've got to consider. So quantity and quality. The position of the casing must be assessed. You need to do logs, you need to assess that capability all the way through and make sure that uh, you've got a good seal on the well before you do the job. And then the well bore isolation. Once you've set your plugs, you can then check the slurry has actually uh, set by testing. You can check the position of the barrier by tagging it with some cement with a drill pipe, stick it on top of it, make sure it's still there, verify it by weight, 10 to 15,000 pounds. You can do it on wireline, obviously you can't put the same weight on there. Um, do a pressure test. 
500 psi above the injection pressure, make sure that it's isolated, um, not exceed the certification, obviously. And then finally, you can do an inflow test, take some pressure off the top by reducing the hydrostatic on the well, and do that maximum differential pressure and see if the well actually holds pressure from below. If you've uh, put in a mechanical plug and then put cement on top of it, a pressure test is really not going to tell you anything because you've already tested the mechanical plug, so that's not very meaningful. So you can tag the barrier, make sure the cement's there, and that's probably all that you need to do. Um, but that also has to be risk assessed, do the full check, make sure everything's absolutely spot on, and you can avoid that. So you can look at these things, risk assess each of the options, and then go now, through tubing operations, obviously, if you're going to be cutting casing and pulling casing and taking well heads off and all that, you need a very big, expensive uh, rig. And there's been a lot of talk about being able to abandon wells through the tubing, just pump cement through the tubing. So it can be done, but you need to know that your cement in the annulus is 100%. You need to have that record. You need to be absolutely certain about it. But it can be done. You can uh, use the, the tubing string as a cement stinger, uh, go down there. But there are a couple of considerations you need to think about. Um, you can save a lot of money, but you can use a, a single cement job. There are inherent risks, and that you need to know that you've got the cement isolation on the annulus. Deviation of the well, when you start thinking about setting a cement plug, deviation of the well, you could imagine a, a well of very high angle, you would simply get the cement slump into the bottom side and then a channel at the top. Um, if your tubing is not is sitting on the bottom, you're not going to have a standoff and there's a danger that you might get a channel all the way up the side of the tubing. So that needs to be considered. So there is some good practice for that. Uh, you need to centralise the tubing, make sure it is in the centre so there's not a, it's not lying on the low side and you end up with a small uh, annular space up there. If possible, move the tubing. Rotating, rotation's excellent because then that'll try to push the cement around the whole uh, diameter of the tubing and reciprocation if possible. Uh, flush, when you're doing that to clean your annular space, uh, you may have to remove the tubing hanger. So the main question on, on through tubing operations is how can we make sure the cement goes around the tubing without leaving the uncemented channel? You need to risk assess that. You need to work that one out. A couple of other stipulations. Obviously, no control lines, no electric lines, which could give a leak. I talked about 45 degrees minimum, uh, sorry, maximum for any a cement job and you need to make sure it's water wet and when you're pumping your cement make sure that you stay in a turbulent regime try to make sure that the, you're cleaning and scrubbing the inside of that tubing and casing as much as possible by the movement of the actual cement itself so that's an old document again but i find it very useful uh, Along the top there, the well abandonment complexity with type 1 is a simple rig. So you rig this operation, uh, type 1. So this is basically a through tubing well abandonment. The same with type 2, well, sl slightly more complex, but it's rigless, low cost. Type 3, here we go, the cost is going up, you need a rig. It's a simple rig, but you still need a rig. Cost is going up. And type 4, a very complex rig, you're probably going in there, uh, maybe doing a bit of fishing, maybe doing a bit of uh, casing cutting, maybe pulling casings, maybe going in there with logs, and maybe going in perforating the uh, annulus and trying to get a seal. So there are some well characteristics that can point you to where you need to be. It's a very good ready reckoner to start off with. So if you've got sustained casing pressure, then there's no choice, you need a complex rig. Um, if you are not cemented, if the case was not cemented, where well, you need to set the, uh, the 
barrier at the cart block, then you've got no choice. You need to go in there and get that cement in there one way or another using an expensive rig. If you've got restricted tubing access to your tubing, then okay, you probably need to, you've got a uh, fish in the well, or you've got deep electrical barriers, you've got annual safety valves, you've got a packer set above the cap rock, that's unfortunately quite common. Um, and you just simply can't get up core tubing or a hydraulic walkover unit, then you need to go for a simple rig. And then, the rest of it, multiple reservoirs, tube and leak, corrosion. So it's really only a, a well with good integrity, no limitations, no problems that you really can do a simple rig with. That's a very easy, simple ready reckoner that uh, gives you an idea of where you are and how much your costs are going to be. So we're starting to finish off here. There is a bunch of jobs for engineers in decommissioning. It's going to take a long time to get this lot sorted out. And there's also a possibility that we might be using some of these old wells for uh, carbon capture and the uh, um, forms of heat out of the, the surface. Uh, geothermal. Some of these old wells could be changed into geothermal. There's a lot of work being done on that recently. Uh, it might be an area where that can be done. And uh, if you don't want to work in Scotland or in the North Sea, Australia. Australia needs a lot of work. They're going to be recommissioning, uh, decommissioning a whole bunch of work. Um, so there's work over there as well, all over the world. So finally, we come to this wellhead coming out of the sea. We've done all our work, we've isolated it all off, we've cut off the wellhead a minimum of three metres or ten foot below the seabed, and we've pulled the whole thing out and now we're off. Job done. So finally, any questions? Well, thank you, Steve. That was uh, very informative, very um very helpful. Uh, I learned a lot and uh, I can see there's actually quite a few good questions have come in. So uh, just just before we jump into the questions that have come in, just a clarification from you. You talked about OG UK a few times. Um, I think they changed their name recently, right? So people will be looking for a different organization now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Oil and Gas UK are no longer Oil and Gas. They are a uh, what did they change it to? Offshore Energies UK. So if you go onto that website, I think it was actually yesterday that they actually uh, got that formalised. So uh, I've not looked at the website, but I think that will be the new one. Offshore Energies UK. They should all be back under that. Awesome. I imagine OG UK will redirect it for a while, but if you can't yeah, find it, then so. there's, a, there's yeah. another place to look. Okay, some, some great questions have come in. Um, there's a couple of questions that are kind of related to each other. So I'll give them both to you and hopefully you can answer them both at the same time. There's, um, as asset ownership is transferred from operator to operator over the life of the field, how do operators truly understand the decommissioning risk that they're taking on, given that the, the data on wells is quite often poor, especially for, um, for, for older wells? And as a very closely related question, Given the duration for installation and, and um, the changes in partnerships and ownership, what are the major hurdles to overcome in terms of uh, accuracy of well conditions and, uh, and, and data retrieval? Yeah, this is one of the major issues that you get when ownership of uh, wells goes over. It can be an absolute minefield. Uh, I've certainly known of uh, platforms, complete platforms full of wells have been sold off by by the money men really rather than the engineers and the information that's required for the actual wells is supposed to get across in the well files but as you know in all that process some of the knowledge always gets lost some guys retire the knowledge gets lost all those little pieces of information that would make that jigsaw a bit more complete all gets lost so that is a big big issue on the question of how much do you know if you were thinking of buying an asset, how much your liabilities are, that's a, that is a multi-million dollar question. You really need to get yourself some engineers who have done some decommissioning to look at the wells and look at the well records and try to work it out. 
Uh, there was one case where a platform that I know of was actually uh, sold to another company effectively. Ownership, operatorship was handed over. However, the original owner retained the decommissioning liability. So in other words, the second operator was going to take out all the oil and gas and then hand the platform back at the end of the life for the first operator to then decommission. Now that led to a couple of big problems because the second operator was priority oil and gas and he was doing things to the wells to get the oil and gas out, which if you had the decommissioning liabilities, you would not have done, you know, thinking like pumping fluids down the annulus just to try to control uh, pressures, but uh, making decommissioning difficult. So that you really do need engineers to review those records and have a look at that before you uh, sign on the dotted line for that one. Okay, thanks for that one. And um, again, another question. Um, what differences are there, or, or indeed are there any differences, uh, between oil wells and gas wells with regards to uh, P&A strategy? So from a legislation point of view, there is basically no change. There's no difference. You, you have to, you've got the same liability, you have the same uh, plugging requirements, you've got to isolate the same reservoirs, whether it's full, full of uh, oil or gas or anything else for that matter. The only issue is that your hydrostatics change. You need to uh, assume a different hydrostatic and uh, different pressures at different formations because it's a gas rather than a, an oil with a certain a specific gravity and weight which will introduce a different pressure. So it's really just a, a um, hydrostatic issue rather than a legislation issue. Okay, thanks. And um, there's a question, I think this is a question specifically about the, uh, the, the, the barrier. Uh, the 100 feet of measured depth, does that need to be contiguous or can it be 100 feet which is kind of distributed throughout the 500 feet? Now, I remember this one. We, <laughs> we had uh, logs which were non-continuous, and we then tried to work out, right, can we add all these up? We've got about here 10 foot, we've got about here 15 foot, we've got about here 20 foot, can we add all this up? And, you know, we went through a whole philosophy risk assessment on it, and it came down to the accuracy of the logs. Did that 10 foot that the logs see was that really 10 foot? Was that more like three foot or something like that? So you have to look at what your logs you're doing, what you're measuring it out, how you're doing it. But I think you can add it up, provided you know your logs are accurate, provided you know your way of measuring it is accurate, and you can get a, a total of 100 foot. I think that's a reasonable thing to do. OK, that's, uh, that sounds good. Um, so. If we're re-entering a well to prepare for decommissioning, and then we find that we've got like zonal cross flow in the well, what actions do we need to take? What steps, what, what do we need to do basically in order to be able to uh, decommission the well? Okay, so if you've got zonal cross flow, you really do have to, and, and, and if that zonal cross flow matters, the first, you know, you may have multiple zones which are all hydrocarbon bearing, and they're all within maybe 200 feet of each other, then maybe it's an acceptable thing to do is to put a plug above all of those zones and just isolate the whole lot off. Uh, maybe that's an acceptable thing. Maybe it's acceptable to allow that zonal cross flow because it's effectively not going to get to the surface. It's not going to get into any other zones. But if one of those is hydrocarbon bearing and another one is water bearing, that's a different issue. You need to get barriers between them. So right. it really depends on, on what sort of formations they are. And again, make reference back to your your uh, legislation that covers you. You know, you need zonal isolation for each individual section unless you can prove that cross flow is not an issue. If you've got cross flow which is not in the well bore, then that's a different issue again. There's nothing really you can do in the well bore other than you know, filling the whole lot up with, well, cement, but that's not going to affect that. So it's it's really just round about the well bore and the annulus. If you have it in the annulus, well, it makes a, 
a good point to maybe perforate that, cut that, and get some isolation in there. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, and um, when you are um, cementing for abandonment or for sort of decom, is there any attempt to minimise the development of those channels that you that you showed us um, by um, local mechanical vibration in the same way as it's done sometimes? Um, on civil engineering on surface construction sites for, for deep foundations uh, and, and so on. Yeah, well, I'm, actually, my name's on a patent, along with others, on a, a, a piece of a tool which we got. We, we, were, we thought about this for a while, you know, when you are constructing something on the surface here, you know, a, a, a slab, you put a vibrator into it and it, it vibrates the cement and makes it actually fit together. We thought, why don't we get ourselves a mud motor, you know, for drilling? And stick a big heavy weight on the end of it and actually just spin it with the cement and see if that creates vibration. And and it did. It actually did create quite a bit of vibration as we were pumping the cement. And we believe that it made a better cement job. So, yes, there are pieces of equipment out there in the market now which can uh, vibrate the cement while you're setting it. Uh, just by the pumping action of pumping it through the cement, mm -hmm. and we believe that improves the the actual cement job. Okay, good, good question. Um, right, there there are, there are more questions coming in. We got we got time for a few more. Um, are there any major differences um, across the? And I, I I imagine there is, but I don't know if you can give us any examples. Big differences between different legislations, and the example the questioner gives is uh, between uh, UK and Norwegian uh, legislation for decommissioning in the North Sea. Yes, yeah, so the major difference is the size of the plugs, the acceptable plugs. So I think in Norway it's in metres, in the UK it's in feet. It's not quite the same, so there is different requirements. Different countries all over the world have different requirements. Some Some have numbers which are extremely low, you know, 20, 30 feet, and you think, my goodness, is that sufficient? But And some of them are a wee bit over the top, you know, 500 foot and things like that. So that's the major difference is the uh, the length of the barrier. The rest of it about quality and quantity is very much similar. Okay, that's, uh, that's good. Um, question which um, I think is about um, sort of uh, carbon storage. Um, so you mentioned the, the OGA stewardship net zero, which suggests decommissioning of wells to facilitate storage projects. And what's the experience in oil and gas with respect to the implementation of barriers that we might need to withstand CO2, uh, possibly supercritical CO2, and any other substances that might be mobilized by its storage? And is cement the only solution to create a barrier or are there other uh, options? Well, there are other options being tested. Uh, I know that there's actually been we've been looking at using thermite as a as a sealing mechanism to melt the the casing and uh, formation as well. So that's certainly been considered. But uh, Oil and Gas UK or the company which <laughs> now is has got guidelines on materials. So there is a set of guidelines out there on material testing and what is acceptable. So there are alternatives. There's out there some plastics that are being tested, uh, thermite is being tested, uh, and there's a whole testing regime available for people to look at on the internet. So that's a really good uh, pointer for that type of thing. Great, thanks. And uh, I'm going to stick with CO2 in a completely different uh, context. Um, question is, what's the implication of well P&A operations in CO2 emissions, and how can it be mitigated? And I think that's um, Talking about uh, sort of emissions from operations and other oh, ways no, of reducing no. emissions from uh, PNA. Okay, so there's two sides of this. If it's a gas well, it's probably talking about methane uh, and methane emissions if the well is not successfully decommissioned. So the bottom line is the well has got to be decommissioned properly. A hundred foot of good cement will uh, certainly stop any uh, methane coming out. But the thing is that you sometimes get methane in the upper uh, formations, you know, just close to the seabed. So you do get a, wee, a bit of that. In fact, that's one of the things that actually, uh, when you're looking to decide where to drill your well, you quite often look for pockmarks on the seabed, which are made by methane emissions. 
and that's just natural occurring uh, gas. So there's that side of things. There's also the, the whole thing that while you're actually out there decommissioning a well, you're probably burning a whole bunch of hydrocarbons in the diesel engines of the, the vessels and the equipment. Mm -hmm. and, and that really needs to be looked at as well, you know, the best way to do things. Uh, it's a wee bit off of the well, but we had a, a pipeline that needed to be uh, decommissioned. And we did this by pumping seawater down through one end of the pipeline and out the other end. And... Uh, and we would measure the, we would clean the fluid that comes out the back end there, and we were going to get to a measure. And someone had actually put into the uh, the specification the same specification for uh, water, which was taken off the side of a production platform. And we were going from something like 90 parts per million to 60 parts per million. And in order to do that, we had sat with two vessels either end for 48 hours burning hydrocarbons into the atmosphere in order to get from 90 parts per million to 60 parts per million of the fluid in this pipeline. And when we stood back and looked at it, we thought, we've done more damage to the environment just trying to get to an unrealistic number. So that's an example of where we need to really consider what we're doing here in the terms of the whole environment to make sure that we're doing the right thing. Yeah, look at it holistically. That's a very good point. It's, it's kind of a, as you say, it's not quite on well decommissioning, but a good illustration, a good example there. So yeah, you really need that. to look at what you're doing. Yep. Yeah. Um, so if uh, what if we're planning for well decommissioning on a collapsed platform and what resources do we need to consider to make sure that we can actually conduct those operations uh, safely? Okay. So this... If you can't get access to the platform, that can be a big problem. The only safe thing to do is probably drill relief wells into the well bores. So you're drilling a, a deviated well into a well bore, into the original well bores, and then filling them up with cement from that point of view. That's been done in a number of occasions in wells which have had blowouts. Uh, mm -hmm. Very costly, uh, very expensive. But if you've got a multi, if you've got a platform you can potentially use one relief well to maybe get three or four well bores and seal them up. Um, otherwise, if you can clear as much debris from the top of the collapsed platform and get a jack up over the top there, that would help a lot. But th those are very specialized uh, techniques that are used. Uh, companies like Wild Well will be able to help you there. I'm sure they've done a lot of that. You get some platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, small platforms get hit by hurricanes. So they've got that sort of business on a regular basis actually trying to get that lot sorted out but that that's going to be it's going to be an expensive operation by the sound of it whichever way you oh want. absolutely yeah yeah hope you're well insured at that point <laughs> yeah um okay um question this is more of a comment really um for actually from oga um saying that uh, might be worth mentioning the guidance for applications for suspension of act inactive wells um, talks about their consenting considerations and consenting durations and the escalation process which can even result in sanctions if the well owner uh, doesn't obtain the required consents um, there is a uh, there's a link i'm not quite sure how we um, sort of share the link in the uh, in, in the talk here but did, have you got any comments on that? I thought it was worth mentioning. Yeah, yeah, I can see I can see the, the uh, question here. Yeah, good piece of information uh, from the OGA. So it's uh, it's on the OGA's website, ogaauthority.co.uk, and it's in media. Five one zero eight OGA suspended wells guidance, and it's a PDF document. So yeah, um, same as Oil and Gas UK or Oil. Offshore Energies UK, as we call it now, the Oil and Gas Authority just simply go onto their website, a whole bunch of information about uh, what they actually have. And uh, one of the other documents I find there that's really useful is the uh, stewardship documents. Those are excellent. Okay. Um, so I've got a couple more questions here in the box. There is there's probably time if somebody wants to submit one or two more questions. We've got until one o'clock. Uh, one of the questions that's in the box, um, are there any lab testing requirements before you go offshore and do the actual uh, P&A? So 
So all the uh, cement which you've done has actually been lab tested multiple times. So you can re you can make reference to that information. Your cement manufacturers, etc., have that. Um, if it's any new stuff, I make reference back to that new materials for P&A uh, documents. So there's certainly plenty of that available. Um, sometimes you do do some lab testing for new equipment. Uh, we certainly did that when we're trying to do that uh, vibration equipment. We did a bunch there. Um, some people have been using explosives to try to uh, perforate casings. There's a whole bunch of lab tests on that. Information for that, you know, if you go to SPE, you'll find that there's, they've got a well abandonment uh, conference, and there's an awful lot of really useful information there. The uh, ICOTA UK, there's a whole bunch of information on their website, and you can uh, join their conference. There's papers every year uh, on PA, so there's a lot of useful information there. Keep up the latest technology. Okay. Um... Questions keep coming in. Um, do the uh, repurposing net zero requirements, uh, do they relate to certain size of wells or do they relate to all wells? And do they include onshore wells as well as offshore? Uh, yeah. Do the repurposing net zero requirements relate to a certain size of well? No, I, I'm, as far as I'm aware, no, it does not. Uh, the only thing I'm thinking of is that oil and gas wells tend to be maybe four and a half inch tubing, five and a half inch tubing, very, if you're very lucky, a seven inch tubing if you've got a really big well. Uh, geothermal wells, on the other hand, tend to be nine and five eight casings, so they tend to be much, much larger wells. So from a repurposing point of view, old oil and gas wells have, are sort of not the ideal sizes. Um, other than that, I don't think there's any issues other than making sure that you... Uh, you plug them properly, get the annual sealed up properly. Okay. Um, probably time for two more questions. Um, what's the policy from government authorities? And you can either answer about UK or about other authorities, you know, depending on how broadly you can answer. When a responsible owner can't be identified for an old well that requires decommissioning. Yeah, there you go. That's a... Uh, that's a very good question. Why can't an old, uh, why can't the responsible owner not be identified for an old well? That would be the question for me. You know, all that's documented of who it what actually was. The the possibility is that the company's gone out of business at some point, um, and the liability cannot be actually pinned down to one of the new companies, which may or may not have come from that. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a I think I'll leave a, that question for a lawyer to answer rather than an engineer to answer, actually, John. That, that, it's possible. I, I guess that might be um, like location dependent as well. You know, on, yeah. onshore wells in certain parts of the world might be might be harder to identify oh, yeah, the yeah. Other than offshore wells in um, more highly regulated uh, locations. Yeah, that's true. You know, on some onshore wells, were not regulated at all. People just drilled them, yeah. got the oil out, and then moved on. Yeah, it's true. Okay, so our uh, Final question. Um, in deep water, what challenges are there in uh, hot tapping and displacing abandonment cement? Okay. When you get to deep water, you, you start to get a whole bunch of different issues with deep water. So um, I could spend another half hour talking about this. The biggest problem with deep water is the, the weight. Well, you've got the weight of the water pushing down on the formation. And if you have anything other than seawater inside your riser, you're putting a pressure onto the well bore, which is greater than, uh, than the formation maybe have seen. So when you start taking it up to the weights of cements, you start putting significant pressure onto the bottom of the well. And uh, if it's very deep water, you may have 5,000 foot of water and then only 10,000 foot of uh, rock formation to hold back that pressure as opposed to a, an ordinary well which maybe got 15,000 foot of uh, rock to hold back that pressure. So the biggest problem that you have in deep water is dealing with that additional hydrostatic head that you get with your fluids which are inside the uh, inside the riser. 
that's why you start going into some of these lightweight cement slurries, these foam cement slurries, some of that stuff that's been attempted to try to keep the weight off the bottom of the well so you don't fracture the formation and end up with all your cement disappearing into the fractures and, and doing a bad job with the whole thing. So that's a, that's a, other, a no, whole yeah. other uh, presentation which we'll not go into because it's now one o'clock. Fair enough. Yeah, it's one o'clock, so it's time for us to close. Uh, there have been two or three questions that come through about uh, copies of uh, slides and recordings. Um, I believe IMAKI normally makes the recordings available online um, a few days after the uh, event. So uh, uh, look at the website. And I think also look at IMAKI's YouTube channel, and uh, this should be available in the uh, not too distant future. Um, I had a number of um, sort of uh, statements of thanks come in from the audience. Not enough time to read them all out. Uh, but I'd like to add my own and say, um, on behalf of everybody who's been listening, I'm sure, thank you, Steve, for a uh, very entertaining and very informative uh, presentation and some great answers to the questions. And uh, at that point, we will um, close the uh, record it, close the event. So um, uh, thanks, everyone, for attending, and uh, have a great rest of your day.